Hey there guys, first off, don't forget to utilize the parts section below if you wish to skip to a certain part of this video. This video may sound kind of intricate at first, but once I start talking about the Iris GMAP tool, it gets much easier. This video is meant for the download data page, which is under the how-to drop-down menu on my website. If you are not viewing this on my website, a link to it is in the description box below under my email address. It can teach you how to find, access, and analyze seismic and GPS deformation data, how to understand the many different types of seismic plots and charts people use, and even hundreds of plots and lots of information pertaining to many different seismic swarms and events. In this video, I'm going to teach you how to find and access seismic data. If you wish to know with what options to analyze this data with, simply go to the how-to drop-down menu and look at the three different programs I talk about. However, I suggest starting with the seismic program Swarm, the program shown here. You may want to start with JAMA Size, as I did, but JAMA Size is extremely more restrictive than the program Swarm. JAMA Size, at least in my opinion, is mainly for quick overview, museums, and for students. It may be frustrating to learn Swarm at first, but my video on that program should help, along with daily experience. The purpose of what I do, teaching people how to find data and analyze it, is to create a new trend in students and would-be amateurs to monitor volcanic and tectonic hazard areas with accuracy. As of right now, not a lot of people know that these options exist. I know for a fact that if every, everyone on the planet knew just how easy it was to find seismic data and analyze it from the comfort of their own home, there would be a far larger amount of people using Swarm and downloading seismic data than there are now. The main outcome of increasing the global usage of Swarm, among other programs, and seismic data for students and amateurs, at least in my hopes, is to make sure that no volcanic activity, whether eruptive or not, goes unchecked. The more eyes, the better, right? Of course, monitoring tectonic activity is crucial, and I do that as well. However, I am more in tune with volcanic activity. For example, one of my favorite types of volcanic events I like to watch out for is low-frequency earthquake. Now, finding seismic data can be frustrating to those who don't know what to do. In this video, I am simply going to be walking you through what I do nearly a hundred times a day. And any important resources, such as the Iris GMAP or Iris Data Select, will be posted below. Now, some parts I show in this video I do skip in my daily analysis. For example, finding the seismic stations, since I have done it so many times for so long that I have many stations and channels memorized. So why don't we start with an example swarm. Let's say a large earthquake swarm just broke out near Yellowstone Lake at Yellowstone National Park in Caldera. And that's exactly what happened right on the beginning of New Year's Eve, December 31st, 2018. So let's act like this just happened. Oh my god, swarm! Remember to always try your best to use the closest seismic station first. Of course others should be used and will be used and can be used if you're analyzing these events, but I like to start with the station that is probably one of the closest ones. So let's click borehole 208 since I already know it was one of the closest stations to this swarm in question. Now remember when using these online web recorders to always use the time to determine what the closest seismic station was. Now I'm not going to show you exactly how to do that in this video and you cannot do it with these web recorders alone, but you can get a general idea. In this case I believe borehole 208 was the closest station to the swarm with station YML coming in second. That is because the closer the station is to an earthquake, the sooner the earthquake will appear on that station. Remember how seismic waves propagate away from their source like a ripple in a pond. So if you think you see an earthquake and it only appears on one station, it might have been a very, very extremely teeny, teeny, tiny, tiny, very, very, very shallow earthquake right near the station. But most of the time, even a negative 0.5 can still show on multiple stations around the area at Yellowstone. So we know that seismic waves travel like that. Always look at multiple stations and cross-correlate. Now you may be asking yourself, what is the point of finding seismic data if we have these web recorders? Well, number one, there are many areas full of stations throughout the United States and the world that do not automatically generate these web recorders on the internet. Number two, these web recorder charts are only, and I mean only, for very quick, and very basic overview to see if there were any earthquakes and around what time they occurred. I tell you now that if you only use these web recorders, you will be deceived. You need to actually analyze the data to come to at least a probable conclusion. But don't worry, it's much easier than it sounds. Now here's the UTC time code on the right, as you can see right, oh, my bad, 
let me pan down time UTC MST is on the left which would be mountain time so that is the time code that we need UTC to access the seismic data from this channel for this time period notice how right here we see the 730 line which would be right here right well that means right here is notice how there is a very barely visible vertical line notice that I'm following it with my cursor all the way down all the way down all the way down to the 23 mark okay so that means all the way up once we've tracked it right here is 723 UTC because 730 would start right here which would be right here as well notice it, it's read from left to right like a book right now when downloading seismic data you of course need to know the time period it is always best to choose a few hours before and a few hours after however I suggest downloading no more than 24 hours worth of data at a time this is because sometimes the program swarm does not like a huge amount of data so when you are done with one file, you could always close it and open the next day's data. But for this example, I just want to use this swarm right here. The second thing you need to know is all of the four different seismic codes required to download data. Sound too confusing? Well, guess again. These are three of the four seismic codes that you will need. Sometimes they do appear in different order, but four are needed regardless. The fourth code is not shown on this station since this station has no location code but I will get into that in just a second. Plus, I'm about to show an option that makes things much, much, much simpler. But first, here is the station code, B208. Here's the channel code, EHC for short period vertical. Short period stations usually start in EH or SH. However, in regards to the Yellowstone stations in the WI network, any SHZ channel you see on the Webby Quarters Online is not real, it's fake. It is an HHZ channel, which is a broadband station with a 1 hertz high pass filter to make it look like it's a short period station. And pretty much all they do is just filter it and slap an SHZ sticker on it, basically. But other areas in the world do have real SHZ channels. But for the WI network at Yellowstone, SHZ is basically not real, as you will see when you look at the actual channel codes from the actual stations. Now the ending, notice right here the end of the channel code is Z is the ground motion, the which way the ground has moved. Z means vertical ground motion, in other words, up or down. E would be east-west, horizontal ground motion. And N would mean north-south, horizontal ground motion. Most of the time, except for intricate analysis, I mainly use EHZ, HHZ, or BHZ channels. BHZ and HHZ channels would be broadband stations or broadband channels, I mean, which usually are more sensitive and show a more broad range of frequencies. And here is the network code. Network codes are always only two characters long. Each network code contains a station or many stations, and each station contains different channels. Now, this Webby quarter only shows us three of the four codes that we need. What about the fourth? The fourth is the location code. Since none is given, the location code would be dash dash. And as you see when we go back, let's go to a WI network. Notice how we do see four codes right here. Here's the station code, channel code, network code, location code right there. But again, if no location code is given, it would be dash dash. Now put all of that aside. Forget about all that. What if you only know the network and that's it? Or let's say that you have no clue what any of the codes are, even the network codes, for the area that you want to gather seismic data from. That is where this tool comes in handy. This is the Iris G map. I use this a lot, and without it, I would have a hard time finding seismic data. It is such a blessing to have a program like this, guys. This tool, along with seismic programs and data accessibility sources, gives you virtually free reign over monitoring any area that you want. Well, at least the areas with online seismic stations. Now for this, you will need to know at least a network code. But do not fret. If you do not know what network you need for the location, that, you know, like Washington State, Yellowstone National Park, anywhere, simply go to my website, go to the More drop-down menu, as you can see right here, and click Network Coverage Help. And that's the page that we are on right now. This shows you most of the available network codes and the areas of the world they are connected to. For example, I have 
areas of interest. Now, here are additional areas down here in other countries as well. But areas of interest are the main ones that I use every day. Notice Yellowstone Caldera National Park, mainly the PB network and the WI network, but there are a few other stations from other networks there, but mainly it's PBWI. Cascadia Subduction Zone, the NV network and the OO network. Sadly, I believe they have shut those networks down. I don't know why. They did have data a long time ago, so you can still access data from the time they were recording data, but recent real-time data is not available anymore. Washington, CC network for the volcanoes in the Cascade Range. Multiple different networks, multiple, multiple ones. The main one is UW for the University of Washington, which the Pacific Northwest Seismic Network helps maintain. But again, notice all these two character location, or excuse me, network codes right here. Feel free to use these. I believe I have every single one on here that I ever use, ever, basically. So, that's there if you need any help. Now, for a much, much, much more in-depth version of that network coverage help, come to this page here. Now, it does have a description of each network, but it, sometimes it's a little vague and it's hard to know which location. But you can always click the network and it'll probably bring up the map and show you where the network is located with all the stations in there. But this will show you the network codes that you need if you cannot find an area of interest from the list on my website. Now, I will leave a link to this iris list below. Notice how there's a great deal, some online, some not. And by the way, if you ever see R like this, R would be restricted data. P would be partially restricted data, meaning you need a password. This is very rare. It does happen from time to time, and I'm very frustrated that they have password protected some seismic data, but it's only like literally 0.05% of the time that I run into that problem. As you can see, basically every single network is open for public data access, almost every single one. There's only a few networks here and there, tiny ones that are restricted. For example, like this one right here. I don't know why, but that's how it is. But all the data that we need for the locations that we need are not restricted. So remember how we wanted to find seismic data for that swarm at Yellowstone? Well, we were going to use Borehole 208. However, I want to use a station actually in the Yellowstone network. Notice here we have network WY for Yellowstone Caldera National Park, which covers the Yellowstone National Park area. Once armed with the two character network code, Simply come back to the Iris G map here, enter the network code, as we will see, WY, and click Update Map, and it'll query it. Once done, notice that, well, when it happens, come on, buddy, notice how there are many stations that pop up, including old stations from like the 80s and the 90s that aren't even used anymore. So it's got a good amount of information of the seismic stations at Yellowstone here. Now, which one should we use? Well, you can pick any station you want and look to see if it's close to the area of interest. But for this example, I wanted to use YML. Let's zoom in. Right here is YML. Notice it pops up a station tab. Now you know the two of the four seismic codes. Right here's the network code and here's the station code. See, almost done. But what about the last two codes, location and channel codes? This one is very, very easy. Simply click the station that you want. It'll open this tab as you see here and click more information. Once done, it will bring up all of the instrumentation data for this one specific station. Notice there is a slew of important information just about this one station. Now you can explore all this stuff later. Right now, we simply need the most recent location and channel codes. Notice we see the one at the top right here is the most recent and has not ended yet basically saying it will need an update in 2599. That really means nothing since they usually change something every 10 years or so. It varies. But for this example, we see 01 is the location code. Notice location code right here, right there. Now, please know the location code does not mean any specific location. This is simply another seismic code that is required to access the data. Once we have the location code, look to the right of it, as you can see right here. Notice this is a 3D station, as I like to call them. We can see EHE, EHN, and EHZ. Put those three together during analysis, and you can get a 3D view, so to speak, of any given event. That shows us that this is one short period station, but one that detects ground motion towards the east and towards the west, towards the north and towards the south, and vertical 
otherwise up or down. So we have the network code right here, WY. We have the station code right here, YML. We have the location code right here, 01. And we have the channel code right here that we want to use, EHZ. But the last thing we need is the time period of the data we want. So let's go back. Let's go and click YML. I believe YML is a little bit ahead, but we can see, remember, it started at about 723 UTC, right? We already saw that borehole 208. Remember, it's best to use about one hour before and one hour after the time period that you want. And we need UTC. UTC, again, is the only time code that you need that is required for seismic data. So that means let's use data from 630 UTC to 1130 UTC, December 31st, 2018 from station YML in the WY network, 01 location code, short period vertical. But where in the heck do we get this data? From here, this is the Iris Data Select URL Builder. Now this is the web service that I use the most to gather all of my seismic data. There are other web services which I have to use from time to time, but I'll show that in a bit. Again, all of this I'm showing you is 100% free no matter what, no matter how much data you download, no joke. If anyone ever tells you it's not, don't fall for it. This also may seem somewhat overwhelming at first, but it didn't take me long to become fluent in finding and accessing seismic data. So armed with the time period of the data we want and the four codes that we not want, excuse me, notice how they fit in perfectly right here. Network, station, location, channel, start time, end time. Let's focus on these first and enter in the parameters. Network code was WY, station code was YML, Location code, 01. Channel code, EHG for short period vertical. Remember, we wanted December 31st, 2018, so type in 28. And this has to be, this is the exact format you have to do. It cannot be different than this, otherwise you will not be able to download the size of data. This is the format for the start and end times. You do the year, which would be 2018, dash. Uh, let's see, what was it? It would be 12 for December, right? Dash, 31 for the day. Now, no spaces. I am saying this right now, no spaces. You separate the date and the time with a T. Now, it's showing a space right here. I don't know why, because I've tried doing a space in the middle before, and it doesn't work. Personally, I've always been told by many people, especially on this website, to do T. Notice that? No spaces, just a T. Now, we go, what was it, 630 UTC? Uh, 0630. Zero, zero. Hour, hour, minute, minute, and seconds. So that is how the format has to be, no matter what. 2018, 12-31. T, what was it? We were going to do to, what, 1730 or something like that? No, 1130. Let's just do to 12. Why don't we just do it to 12? So we got everything we need right here. So once that's done, there's only one other option you must check. That is the output format format right here. All other options I never change, including this one, but make sure it is set to mini seed. You can select other ones if you want, but I rarely do at all. So all the parameters are set completely. Remember the four codes, the time period, and make sure it is set to mini seed. Once that all of that is accomplished, click the link that you see right here that says click link. Boom. It automatically updates with every stroke of a key. And let's see, let's check the downloads. It has downloaded. Okay, that's good. Now, I, although I clicked it and nothing popped up, as you saw, it did download. I have it automatically set to download without a window popping up, but usually you will see the normal download window pop up. So you would just click OK or whatever and let it download. Also, this is a professional institution you are gathering data from. All the sources you see in this video are 100% safe with zero chance of any computer viruses. Now the data has been downloaded. So let's open it in a seismic program and see if it worked. So here we are in the seismic program swarm. We want to look at the December 31st, 2018 earthquake swarm near Yellowstone Lake. Let's see, the last one I downloaded was right here. Now the file that you save will say FDSNWS data select and it will not have the time period of the data that you selected. It will only say the date and the time that you downloaded the data. But don't worry, you, it'll obviously show you all the information you need when you open it up. For example, the channel codes and all that good stuff. Why won't it open? There we go. YML, 
Notice we do have the earthquake swarm right here for the time period that we had selected. Now if you want to learn how to use the seismic program swarm, just go to the how to drop down menu and click the swarm page. Notice we can look at earthquakes via seismogram plots if we want. Go to the spectrogram plot if you wish. Here they are. This is the December 31st earthquake swarm at Yellowstone. Remember, there's a good 20 years or so of data in the IRIS archives, so you can get a good view of a lot of events that occur. This was a very, 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 very strange earthquake swarm at Yellowstone. Very odd. I mean, look at these. Look at the frequencies, guys. Very strange. Check out the dominant frequencies of that. Very interesting, guys. Very interesting. So I'm not trying to do analysis right now, but that's pretty much it, guys. So that was the data that we wanted to see. Isn't it cool how this possibility exists? But what about the other web services available? Now the next option is the uh, the Iris Time Series URL Builder web service. Now I don't use this much anymore except for seismic audio. Of course this is great for some people, but my computer does not really allow large SAC files to run in the program Swarm, so I have to primarily use mini-seed format, which in my opinion is just as good as SAC, but for some reason, the mini seed format from the time series URL builder does not work in Swarm. But if you go to the data select URL builder, it works from here. I have no idea why that is. Hopefully, eventually it's fixed. But again, if you want to, to download seismic data, just do the data select if you want. Plus, they have many options on here that you can use in this program Swarm anyways. But if you want seismic audio, come to the time series URL builder here. This tool will allow you to hear seismic audio for any given event and then save it to your computer .wav format, WAV. Now let's go back to Seismic Station YML, if it will let me at all, there we go. Here we are at YML. So why don't we select the time period of data for, for this data for the swarm right here. Let's see, what is that? 1031 would be right there, so that's about 1015. So let's do from 10 to 1030 shall we so that would show pretty much this part of the swarm right here very quick but let's do it let's go to the iris time series url builder go back so for that time period let's see wy network code yml station code 01 location code ehz ehz okay 2018 12 31 t what was it? It was from 10, right? 10 UTC. Remember, hour, hour, minute, minute, second, second, with a T in the middle with the date beforehand. 2018-12-31. T, let's do to 10.35. Whoops. <laughs> 35 UTC. So that'll show 35 minutes of seismic data, right? Well, let's go all the way down. Go to Format. The next thing you want to press is Format. Go to audio right here. Notice it says audio. Click that. Then last thing that I edit, check this box, audio sample rate. This will change the speed of the audio you are hearing. A higher audio sample rate will be faster. A lower audio sample rate will be slower. But if you get to a certain point and it gets slower and slower and slower, sometimes it's harder to hear. So I kind of like to speed it up a lot. But for this example, I'm just going to do, let's just do 7,000 uh, audio sample rate. And sometimes when I'm actually trying to get accurate seismic audio and make it sound perfect, I have to edit this a lot. So we got that for the seismic audio. Just like before, click this. And usually a download window will pop up, but I already have it automatically set to download anything that I press. So that was the seismic audio. Now that the audio has been downloaded, let's hear what that piece sounded like. I suggest using headphones, but be careful of the sudden increase in volume if it does occur. So, that was pretty interesting, guys. 
Now, what about the other ones? Well, here we are at service.ncdc.org, FDSNWS slash data select slash one. This is the data select URL builder, but for the NCEDC database. Now, this is extremely similar to the Iris one. Again, links to everything are below. And again, if you're viewing this on YouTube and, and I'm missing a link in the description box, simply go to my website and just check out the download data page on there under the how-to drop-down menu, excuse me. Now, this is mainly here, the NCDC Data Select URL Builder is mainly for California. If you ever try to access seismic data from California on the IRIS web service and it doesn't work, even though you know all the parameters are correct, you might want to try getting the data from here, the NCDC Data Select build, URL Builder, or this one right here, the SCDC. Earthquake Data Center, Data Select, URL Builder, which is very similar, and it's follows by the FDSN Data Select Web Service Standards, so it's basically exactly the same. Network Station, Channel, Location, Start Time, End Time. You notice right here is the format where you should, uh, should do the date and the time, just like we did on Iris. Now, if all else fails, keep trying. I failed so many times at first and got extremely frustrated, but I quickly learned it. Now you can always choose to either email me or a professional if you need any additional help. Now there are some networks that you might come across that reside within foreign data, data centers, excuse me, not accessible by IRIS, NCEDC, or SCEDC. So what do you do? Well, you could first come here to fdsn.org slash web services slash data centers. FDSN is the International Federation of Digital Seismograph Networks. This will show you the data select URL builders from all data centers. However, please know that some are not functional for some reason. For example, INGV. Let's click the data select, open link in new tab. This is for Italy. This is seismic data from Italy. Now, when it'll let me notice right here, let's go to the URL builder, quick builder. Notice, I remember how it has to build the URL at the bottom? Well, something is wrong. Look, it's not even responding. Notice that? Nothing. What the heck? Nothing. Nothing. It's not responding to anything I'm putting in. So that was kind of frustrating at first. So let's say, I wanted to obtain data from the IV network, which is the main seismograph network for Italy. Yes, Italy, guys. But let's be a little more intricate, shall we? What if I wanted one from Mount Etna? Let's go all the way down to Mount Etna, which is slowly sliding to its demise. Where's the one I wanted to use? Here's the example station, ESLN. Now, let's obtain the data from this station here on Mount Etna. And it seems this station in the IV network is in the Italian seismic database. Notice the data center, INGV. But when, again, when we go back to their data select URL builder, like we just saw, nothing. It, every, no matter what you enter, it doesn't give you a URL. So there's, even if you uncheck this, look, check it out, still nothing. It doesn't give you any link whatsoever at all. Nothing happens and nothing appears for the URL which is supposed to be in the process of being built while entering these parameters. When coming across this, I was extremely dismayed, seeing that I really wanted to study the seismic events that were occurring about Etna since eruptive activity was starting to increase. Haha, <laughs> well, I found a way. And boy, this probably took me around 50 tries to get down. I was already armed with the four seismic codes I needed that Iris told me for the station ESLN, right? I already had the four seismic codes and the time period, so at least I had that. But what do I do next? I tried many different link combinations, seeing that links are how you download the data directly from the instruments. So remember the page that we were just on? This is what happened, and follow me slowly. I copied the entire link, which, let me just select it. I copied the entire link, which I have selected right here. That's the entire link that I copied and pasted into Microsoft Word. Then I copied a random download link from Iris and pasted it at the end, all except this first section. For example, I, let's say I got some data from Station YMC. I copied everything after the one because FDS, uh, FDSN, the Federation for Digital Seismograph Networks, they say this is the basically the format it has to use 
for all the data centers. This is what they all use. This is the format, their website, FDSN, data select, and a one. So I already knew that that's going to be the same no matter what, but a little bit different with the link at the beginning. So I copied and pasted something else from another station from Iris, but just this section I have selected right here. And I knew that no station from Iris would be downloaded from this link, obviously. But all I did next was, was edit the exact parameters I needed. For example, query start time. This is start time, end time in the same format and separates everything. End time, 2019, 2014, blah, 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 blah. Net means network. I selected the uh, IV network, which is what I wanted. STA means station. I put the station code there. LOC means location code. There is no location code given, so it's dash dash. CHA means channel. I wanted BHZ, so I selected that. Format, mini seed, and everything else is the same. Much to my surprise, I completed it and it finally worked. I had to completely build my own custom URL to download the data from the Italian Seismic Database. And boy, I was so happy, guys. I immediately started creating plots of the recent Mount Etna eruption, many of which can be seen in my post about Mount Etna on my Seismo blog that I did months ago. So if you ever cannot find any data that you need, please shoot me an email. I can pretty much find any seismic data from any accessible station on the entire planet. Sadly though, there are still many areas of the world that are not seismically monitored. Moving on, let's see if this link still works. Let's see what Mount Etna in Italy has been up to for the past two days. So, we have everything we need. We got the station code, network code, location code, and channel code, but the end time, start time and end time, notice right here, let's see, let's do four, uh, so let's do 18, zero, 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 end time, let's see, it is not the 20th yet, it's not April 20th yet, but I'm just going to do that just to top it off to get the most recent data, the 20th at zero UTC, got that, got that, okay, so all of it is good, we're going to see the past two days worth of data for Mount Etna from station ESLN, copy that, let's go up here, go all the way up here, yeah, come on, Press paste, notice that, everything's good, press enter. And let's see, is it downloading? Yes, it downloaded right here. Notice how it downloads just as FDSNWS, because this is from a foreign data center, guys. Foreign data center here. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go into Seismic Program Swarm, we're gonna go up, file, cl clear cache, close file, open file, the one we had started with just FDSNWS, and that's it. And here it is, right here. I believe that's it. Yes, it is. Right here. Press open. ESLN in the IV network, BHZ. So the link that I built worked because their URL builder didn't work at all. So technically, guys, I completely skipped through them. I didn't even go through the seismologists at all or their data center. I literally created the link and gathered the data straight. And I mean smack dab straight from the seismic station itself. Double click it real quick. And it's going to take a minute to load, guys, because sometimes it's a little bit glitchy. Okay, so apparently the data has been recently corrupted for ESLN just as of the past few days. So what I'm going to do, remember, here's the link that I just entered, right? 418 to 420. Now, the data was corrupted, guys. I, something's going on with that seismic station. But let's go to 2018 dash 12 dash 30 zero, zero UTC and then let's go over here and change the end time to 2018 12 and let's do third actually you know what let's do 2019 dash 01 dash 01 January 1st so let's click enter and it's downloading notice right here it is downloading as we speak okay there we go now this will show you some of the data I believe it's after this was about five days or so after the eruptive activity at Mount Etna, FDSNWS, let's see where is it, there it is right here, let's open, and let's see what it gives us, perfect, perfect, so we got the data guys, we've got the data, notice many different earthquakes, you can turn on spectrogram if you want, turn on waveforms, some of the stations are kind of old in the Italian network, this one only goes to 10 hertz, but still shows good activity, Remember, we can see multiple high frequency and low frequency events, including low frequency harmonic tremor down here, harmonic volcanic tremor, which Mount Etna sees all the time. 
I mean, basically constantly because it's always erupting, guys. Especially during the eruptive activity, Harmonic Volcanic Tremor was just off the charts. Here's an episode of Harmonic Volcanic Tremor right here. Notice, there it is. Yep, very interesting. Studying Harmonic Volcanic Tremor from Mount Etna. Who would have thunk it, right? Multiple different earthquakes, multiple earthquakes, and yeah, pretty cool. Mount Etna, guys. So that is it, folks. Finally, these videos are done. Sorry it was so long, but I do not believe that is much of an issue since I do provide a parts section. I really hope that this video showed you just how free and accessible global seismic data really is. Even from areas that seem impossible to download seismic data from. For example, from the Italian stations. Never let anyone tell you that it is not this easy. It may be frustrating at first, but it's very easy once you get the hang of it. Heck, I was even able to create my own custom link to download data probably not many people have figured out how to download. And you can too. Seismic monitoring of volcanic and tectonic hazard areas is extremely important in my opinion. However, it, now it can be done in the comfort of your own home. However, once you learn how to do this and how to use Swarm or another seismic program, I suggest the very next step would be to download data in mass for past confirmed seismic events. This is a method that you can use to self-teach yourself about what different seismic events look like. Don't know what low-frequency harmonic tremor looks like? Don't fret! Simply download data from a volcano, for example, Vinny Aminoff in Alaska in September through December of 2018, that has already seen confirmed low-frequency tremor, usually called volcanic or harmonic tremor. Don't know what a nuclear explosion looks like? Don't fret! Simply download the seismic data from stations around North Korea and look at the date and times so of their past nuclear tests. Above all, any earthquake reported on the USGS earthquake site contains an event page. I'm sure many of you have seen these USGS event pages. However, if you haven't, all you have to do is go to earthquake.usgs.gov, click an earthquake of interest, then click the earthquake in the tab it opens. This will open the event page. Then if your goal is to study any given event, this event shown here being random for this example, then let's see, simply click origin right here. And what's here? Click phases. Once you click phases, click arrival time just once, guys. The station labeled first is almost always the closest seismic station to the source since it had the shortest arrival time. You can, of course, use other stations on this list, and you probably will. Notice it gives you the four codes. Actually, it gives you three codes here, but remember, if it doesn't give you a location code, just use dash dash. So you've got the station codes that you need. And you got the date and the time in UTC right up here, of course. Now you can use the mini web services. Data select ones are highly suggested in mini seed format to download the data from any station you want to any event you want. You can even use the earthquake catalog. Go to advanced options and check non-earthquakes for any specific time frame. That will show you exotic events. You can even edit the list so it doesn't show quarry or mine blasts unless you want to study them, of course. Using all these options, I have learned an insane amount of information. So much so that there's still information that I've learned that is not in this video. But then again, I still have a lot to learn. I've studied in great detail harmonic and volcanic tremor, low-frequency earthquakes, nuclear explosions, asteroid explosions, mine collapses, ice earthquakes, glacial tremor, volcanic explosions and eruptions, hybrid earthquakes, sonic booms, rock bursts, and much, much more. This is just the start, folks. Once you go down this path, you cannot come back. It's an amazing experience when you find out that these possibilities exist. Even more so that it is independent from the professionals and independent from YouTubers, so you can be the judge. Well, unless the seismic station's offline. <laughs> I hope this video helped you learn a lot, and this all just barely scratches the surface. Most data has been archived digitally since the year 2000 to 2002, so there's almost two decades worth of data from thousands upon thousands of seismic stations. Time to analyze, guys. Please have a great day and let me know if you learned anything. Please share this video if you have. I want to get the word out there that these sort of things do exist. Not many people know they do, and even the people that want to monitor these areas still don't know that these possibilities exist. Otherwise, we'd be seeing it used a lot more than it is now. I will continue to monitor volcanic and tectonic hazard areas and will always look at the data with no bias, even if it goes against a theory of mine. 
Be wary of many YouTubers out there who are looking for money. Sure, they have to make a living too, and not all of them are untrustworthy. However, you never know who will be a scammer when you first come across them, so just be careful. God bless, and I'll see you guys soon. Remember, the truth is considered hate or fear to those who hate or fear the truth.